gave me life and now I can't explain just how much you mean to me now you have saved me Lord I give all that I am to you every day I can be a light to shine your day every day Lord I learn to stand upon your word and I pray that I I may come to know you more you would guide me in every single step I take that every day I could be a light to your world every day you I live for every day follow after you every day walk upon your word and I pray that I, that I may come to know you more that you may guide me in every single step I take that every day I can be a light unto the world every day you I live for every day walk song um, every day that Chris performed for us. The idea is that every day, every time we wake up, it's a day that we can live and serve and worship the Lord. Uh, While today is Sunday, and of course we make that the Lord's day, we are commanded to gather and to worship on Sunday. That is not the only day we live for the Lord. So that song reminds us that every day is the day we worship God. Thanks for joining us. Um, We hope that you are Um, encouraged and uplifted through service today, uh, through the music, through the reading of Scripture, and through the preaching of God's Word. So thanks for tuning in.
I was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight It was my tomb Till I met you I was breathing but My failures I tried to hide It was my tomb Till I met you You called my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the dark I needed rescue, my sin was heavy Chains break at the weight of your glory I needed shelter, I was an orphan And you called me a citizen of heaven When I was broken, you were my healing Your love is the air that I'm breathing I have a future, my eyes are Some of you saw on Facebook this week, we posted about the stock sales, Corey and Abby and their children. They were scheduled to come back to the States uh, last week for furlough and spend the summer traveling around to their supporting churches and kind of reconnecting here in the States. Uh, but because of the COVID-19 virus, they are um, in Southern Africa. They are stuck there uh, for an unforetold amount of time. So we just want to remind you to continue to pray for not only the stock sales, but all of our missionaries around the globe um, because they are serving in the middle of this crisis as well. And the plans that they made have been disrupted and turned upside down. And of course, they are wondering, what does this mean for their ministry? And are the churches back home still able to carry support for us? So 
uh, we just want to remind you to lift them up in prayer and to continue to give knowing that that is going to go to support those missionaries, our missions trips, uh, different organizations that we support, and of course, missions right here locally like the Food Pantry, Crisis Pregnancy Center, and so on and so forth. Thank you for your support, uh, for your past support, your support today, and the continued support in the future. Mark 11, 1 through 11. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethphage and Bethany, at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt tied, on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it and will send it back here immediately. And they went away and found a colt tied at a door outside in the street and they untied it. And some of those standing there said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? And they told them what Jesus had said and they let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it and he sat on it. And many spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the fields. And those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. And he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. The passage that Addison just read to you in Mark chapter 11 is a story recounting the entrance of Christ into Jerusalem. The people of the town gathered round, and as he was entering on this colt, um, they laid down palm branches and some laid down their coats and they celebrated and they shouted, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We celebrate this day in our calendar and we call it Palm Sunday. And it's a reminder of the day that Jesus came into Jerusalem and it was the entrance or the beginning of what we call Holy Week. This entrance will lead us through seven days and on Friday he will be uh, crucified and on Sunday morning, of course, we know that he resurrects from the dead, from the grave, shows himself alive, not only to his disciples and those that know him well, but to 500 people over the period of 40 days. I want to talk a little bit to you about this entrance into Jerusalem, this Palm Sunday uh, storyline. If we go back into the context of that day, imagine you were there and you were alive and living in Jerusalem. There's a little bit of culture that goes into this story. So Jesus comes riding into town on a donkey. And there's a reason behind that. He was going to be hailed king of the Jews. Pilate's going to ask him, they say that you're the king of the Jews. What do you say? Right? There's this idea that Jesus is a king. Well, if he was a king that was coming to declare war or was ready for war, he would have actually ridden into town on a horse. And that would show that he was a king ready for war and that he was going to become the warrior king. But Christ didn't do that. Christ rode in on a donkey. And that said something to the people that saw it. It said that he was a king that was going to symbolize peace or bring peace into the land. He chose a donkey to show that the time for peace had come. Now the people that saw him that day, they were waiting a king. They hadn't had a king in a long, long time and they were praying for a king and there was prophecies that a king would come. And they wanted this king to come into town and to stomp out Roman rule. And so they wanted a warrior king. They wanted a king on a horse, a king that would declare war against their oppressors. But here Jesus is, the king of kings, lord of lords, but he's riding on a donkey. And he's saying to the people in Jerusalem and the surrounding areas that I am a king who brings peace. Well, the people celebrated even though this isn't exactly what they thought it would be like, and as they imagined, the prophecy would be fulfilled and there would be this great war against Roman rule or against the oppression that they were under, yet they still celebrated. The Bible says that they threw palm branches in front of him onto the ground as a symbol that they accepted him. And they began to sing and to worship him and hailed him as their king. Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. 
thus giving today its name, Palm Sunday. But few of us actually know that there's another name given to this day besides Palm Sunday. Do you know what it is? If you know what it is, that second name given to Palm Sunday, post it in the comments. Let's see how much Bible trivia you actually know. The second name that it's called is Passion Sunday. Now we know the week to come is Passion Week or the Passion of Christ, and that's all of the events that are going to take place. But actually this day, this day that we're commemorating is not only called Palm Sunday, but it's also called Passion Sunday. But you rarely hear it called that. I have a a thought, maybe an opinion on that. I think it's because we'd rather avoid the pain and suffering that the word passion evokes. You see, passion um, concerning this week isn't about um, the passion that we think of in the English dictionary, but it's actually the, the unfolding events of the pain and suffering and torture that Christ will go through in order to pay for our sin debt. So we don't call it Passion Sunday. We'd rather skip ahead to the resurrection and His appearance to the followers and the 500 people over the course of 40 days, that celebratory, pleasant things to come. We jump ahead or we move past the Passion. So today, do I focus on the palm or do I focus on the Passion? Do I focus on the celebration that Palm Sunday is? Or do I focus focus on Passion or Passion Sunday and all of the events that are leading us up to the resurrection? You see, a Palm Sunday sermon would include how people traveled great distances hearing that the king was coming to Jerusalem and they would show up to celebrate and to worship the new king of the Jews. A Palm Sunday sermon would include how they lay down their branches in front of him and they made a big deal and they celebrated him as he rode into Jerusalem. It would also include how happy they were to see him. Finally, the king of the Jews is here. The prophecies are fulfilled. If I preached about Palm Sunday, I'd have to talk about how these events fulfilled all of the prophecies of long ago, especially the one in Zechariah foretold 800 years before that event, that day where Jesus rode the donkey to town. And how Zechariah would foretell that this new king would borrow a donkey that had never rid, be ridden on before, and he would enter into the gates of the temple. A Palm Sunday message would speak to how this day was like no other day before it. It's a day of great hope for people who have lived in hopelessness for a really long time so yeah warrior king or king of peace it didn't matter the people were ecstatic that they had a king again the hope that it brought but on the other hand if i preach this passion sunday message it would be a totally different story that i would be telling because a passion sunday message um, talks about the other side of the coin i'd have to tell you that the parade was not a parade of celebration, but it was actually a a funeral procession. It was Christ being led to the slaughter and death. This day marked the beginning of the end, a week of betrayal by one of his closest friends, a week that would end in great suffering, a mock trial, and a horrendous death. A Passion Sunday message would speak to how the same people that cried Hosanna, Hosea, Hosanna would in just four days from now be the same people that shout crucify Him. Give us Barabbas, but crucify Jesus. A Passion Sunday message would include the stories of the Last Supper together with His disciples. Of how He would get up from the table and He would wrap a towel around His waist and He would bend low and take on the role of a servant and wash his disciples' feet. It would be the story of how he shared with them the things that he wanted them to remember most, this last moment together as the twelve with their leader, talking about leadership, servanthood, and how to remember his death, the broken body 
and his spilled blood. I'd have to share the stories of his arrest, how Judas would walk up to him in the garden and kiss him on his cheek and betray him with a sign of affection. I'd have to talk to you about the beating he took in City Square, where they would tie him to a post and they would give him 39 lashes across his back and chest. The Bible says that he was beaten so bad that he no longer looked like a human as he carried the cross through the town leading to the Golgotha, the place of the skull. Where there I would have to tell you the story of how they would nail him to a cross through his wrists and his ankles and they would stand him up in a cross in that dry and desert land and he would hang there till he gave his last breath finishing the work that he came to do. Those are two different stories. Palm Sunday is all about glory and exaltation and adoration, hope and excitement. Passion Sunday is all about darkness and death and betrayal, gloom. It's the excitement of his entrance into town or the agony of his death outside of the city walls. It's the celebration of the parade into Jerusalem or the torture and death found at the cross. What do we possibly talk about? Once a young farm boy lived on the outskirts of town. He was coming home from school one day and saw some men putting up a poster on a fence. He hung around until they finished and then he went over to read the poster. It told of a real live circus coming to town, one that had animals and clowns and everything. The boy rushed home and told his dad all about it and said, Dad, could I go? Could I go? Could I go see the circus? The father knew that they didn't have much money to spare, but told his boy that he could go anyway. Come the day of the circus, the boy hurriedly finished all his chores and then changed his clothes and then presented himself to the father, eager to be able to run off to see the circus. The father smiled at his son's excitement and handed over to him a dollar. This was more money than the boy had ever seen before. His father told him, have a good time, son, but be careful. Make sure to come home immediately after the circus is over. And off the boy ran. When he got to town, he saw the whole town standing on either side of the road, and then he heard the noises. Here comes the circus, he thought to himself. His heart raced and his eyes got big as the band played their instruments walking past him on the road. Next came some animals in cages, animals he had never seen before, some small, some large, some cute, some terrible. He was scared, but he stood his ground. How exciting this was. Then group after group, all kinds of neat and weird people and neat and weird things came by him. This lasted for the longest time, and then at the very end, there was this clown all by himself walking, pulling up the rear of everything that he had saw before. Of course, this clown had the traditional clown garb on, bright colors and face paint and a big bright red smile. And of course, the big floppy shoes. When the boy saw the clown, he ran up to him and he dug out of his pocket the dollar that his dad gave him and shoved it into the clown's chest and said, thank you, thank you, this was so much fun. Then the boy went home satisfied. Now we know he only saw the parade and missed the entire circus. But for him, he thought he had seen it all. This is sometimes how we are with Holy Week. We see the celebration at the first part of it when Christ comes in, this parade, this procession into the Temple Mount and all the celebration that goes with it. And then we see the end where there's this resurrection from the dead and this ascension back to heaven and the giving of the Great Commission. But we miss everything in the middle. Much like that boy. And we leave the scene thinking we've seen it all, but we haven't. 
We've missed the part in the middle. And I want to say to you today that the part in the middle really matters. It would be much like reading the first chapter of a novel, skipping to the last chapter and reading it, and then closing the book thinking we know the whole story, but in reality we don't know the whole story at all. In Mark's recounting of the events, in Mark chapter 11, his recount is completely different than all of the other Gospels, Matthew, Luke, and John. Mark takes an approach that is not only excitement of Palm Sunday, but is also somber because of the events that are coming. You see, the disciples have reluctantly followed Jesus to Jerusalem. They didn't want to go, but they did. They were afraid because Jesus had told them on several occasions that Jerusalem is where he would be killed. It would be the place of his death. Matthew 16, verse 21 says that. It says, From that time Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And then when the prediction about the donkey is foretold and now comes true because Jesus does exactly what the prophet 800 years ago said he would do, their anxiety and fear ramps up because now they realize that these predictions are starting to come true And this prediction of Jesus being killed in Jerusalem is going to come true as well. The Gospel of Mark's account is both Palm Sunday celebration, Passion Sunday, gloom and despair. It's both celebratory and somber. And if we are to do justice of those events that happened long ago, we've got to recognize that both things happened today. There is a celebration, but there is also a passion. Some events that unfold that are terrible and horrible and oftentimes hard to get our mind and our head around. But even as I say this, there's a a tendency for us as humans to dwell on only the good times and to avoid hard times. And this is, this is a true statement, and I've seen it play out over and over and over in the ministry. We're, we're all about the baby showers and the weddings, but so very few of us attend funerals or show up at the hospital when our friends are going through hard times. We tend to think about uplifting things in life instead of those things that make us sad, even if the sad thing is a message that we really need to hear. Some of you... You don't watch movies that cause you to cry. You, you, you push those away or you've not seen The Passion of Christ by Mel Gibson because the scenes and the, the thought of that is just too hard to bear. So you avoid those things and you only put those things in front of you that make you happy and that are cheerful and that are high points. And I understand that. I'm not trying to convince you otherwise. Other than I would say this, that sometimes... In pushing those hard things away, you miss things that are meaningful and deep and needful. Not only for yourself, but for others as well. So we must look at the good and the bad. So that we can better understand that Jesus Christ deliberately chose the Passion Week. He deliberately chose the suffering and the torture And the death. He chose those things. For us. We need to understand he did so because of his great love for humanity. In Philippians chapter 2 verses 8 through 11. I want to read those verses to you. So that you can understand how he really did choose those things. Those things didn't happen to him. He chose them. The Bible says that Christ humbled himself. By becoming obedient to the point of death even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every other name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death even death on a cross. He put himself in a position to do this. 
So how do we respond to that? That Christ would do this for us. That he would go through Passion Week and all of the events that would unfold Monday and Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and then leading to the Resurrection Sunday. How do we respond to the fact that he did this for us? Another question to ask here, are we walking a similar path that Christ walked? Or that Jesus walked? Are we willing to go places or do things that may be uncomfortable and hard for us? Are we willing to do these things to let others know how much we love them, like Christ did for us to show us how much He loved us? They can be practical things. I mentioned earlier, it can be attending a funeral of a friend's loved one or attending a funeral of a an extended relative, and while that's hard and and none of us really want to be in those rooms because of this awakening of the idea that we are all finite beings, but being there for our friends, being there for our loved ones is so meaningful to them. Maybe it's visiting a neighbor or friend that's incarcerated or in jail, or that's isolated. Maybe they're shut-ins and they're not able to get out anymore because they can't drive or because they have no one to take them places. And we go visit them and yeah, sometimes it's hard because it's, it's in a hospital or it's in a nursing home or it's in a place that we wouldn't normally go. But going and doing that hard thing means so much to them. And it shows that you love them. Maybe it's being there for the family while their loved one is having surgery. or Maybe it's being there while someone is passing away, passing from this life to the next. And it's hard to watch people die. But it's so meaningful to be there in those moments so that they know that they are loved. Maybe it's serving at a homeless shelter or at a soup kitchen or at a battered woman's shelter or a crisis pregnancy center where it's difficult situations, it's not places we would normally go, but it's needed. Offering support and kindness. Being on the front lines for those people that are on the fringe. Maybe it's making a phone call to those who are isolated right now and removed from society. And it's us just taking the time to remember those people and reaching out and saying, hey, I love you. I see you. I haven't forgotten you. Sending cards or going out of your way to lift someone up. Christ didn't avoid these uncomfortable places. He stepped out of the celebration of Palm Sunday and into Passion Sunday and into Passion Week. And he began to be in some very hard and difficult moments to show you and to show me, to show this whole world the amount of love he really had. So as we celebrate Palm Sunday and we take our journey into the Passion Week, let us do so by remembering why all of this happened. Not just for me, but for you and for everyone else. Take some time here over the next few days and experience with us the events that unfold. Help us walk this week and lead into the empty tomb. And yes, we want to celebrate that and we want to We want to make that the monumental event. And that's what our whole faith is built around. The fact that our Lord not only lived and died, but lives again. Lives again. But We also want to take the time throughout this week and celebrate and recognize and acknowledge the other events that took place. Because the middle matters. The beginning and the end and the middle matters all matter. So I want to invite you on several evenings, come and join us this week. Um, I will post live videos walking you through the events of Holy Week every night um, at 7 p.m. Monday, Jesus enters the temple and cleanses the temple. Many of you know that story. He will pass by a fig tree and he will curse that fig tree. On Tuesday, his authority is going to be questioned. We're going to talk about that and what that meant, why the religious leaders did that. Thursday, he has a last meal with his followers. 
Judas leaves the room, goes off, and comes back and meets him in the Garden of Gethsemane where he'll betray him. Friday, he is tortured and flogged and will be crucified. And Saturday, there's complete silence. And what does that mean? And why? And then, of course, I want to encourage you to join us again next Sunday at 11 a.m. as we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior. And what does a resurrected King and what does a resurrected Lord and what does a resurrected Savior mean to you now and to your future? Thank you for joining in this week. Thank you for continuing to press in and lean into the Lord. And again, I want you to know that we're praying for you and that God sees you. God knows what you're going through, that God is not distant from you. God has not abandoned you at all. In fact, in many ways, God has leaned in and gotten closer to you than you've ever really known. And many of you are starting to sense that, that God is near. Continue to stay with us um, throughout the week so that we can walk you through these events and show you what the Lord did for you, for your soul. In just a moment, we're going to sing a song that we sang earlier, Glorious Day, and how we came up out of that grave and we are no longer shackled by sin. I pray that that's your story, that you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. If you haven't, I want to have that conversation with you. Um, private message me through Facebook or pri private message me through the church's Facebook account. Text me, email me, whatever you have to do to get a hold of me. Let me take a moment or two and talk to you about what it means to give your life to follow Jesus Christ, to make him your king, your Lord. I want to pray for you now. Heavenly Father, for everyone that is with us and tuning in here with this live event, I want you to bless them, Lord. Help them to know that your hand is upon their life. That you have ordered their steps. That you're not surprised by this pandemic. That you're not taken aback. That you're not on your heels trying to figure out what's going to happen. Lord, you know all of this. You are sovereign God. You are in control. You didn't cause this. This isn't some kind of punishment on us, but this is the result of sin. This is the result of brokenness. This is the result of sickness. And we are facing the consequences of all those things. But in those consequences, you are Lord. You are God. And you are in control. God, help us to give our lives over to you, to trust you, to place our faith in you, even though we don't know what the outcome of this looks like. But we can trust that you do. Lord, for anyone that's under the sound of my voice that doesn't know Christ as their Lord and Savior, Holy Spirit, I pray that you prick their heart, that you compel them to come to the cross where Jesus Christ bled and died. But not only the cross, but also to the empty tomb where he resurrected himself from the dead so that he could have power over death, victory over death, and so that we could too. And that alive in Christ is alive eternally with him in glory. We would give our hearts to him and become his child and have hope eternal that one day we will pass from this life to the next and we will have eternity with God, our Creator. Amen. I was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight it was my tomb Till I met you I was breathing but not alive All my failures I tried to hide It was my
rescue my sin was heavy chains break at the weight of your glory i needed shelter i was an orphan and you called me a citizen of heaven when i was broken you were my healing your love is the air that i God bless you, and we'll see you again real soon.